Section 16 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Section 16 The Atom Smasher by Victor Rousseau. Chapter 1 The Vanishing Place. Look at that plane! That fellow's crazy! Took off with the wind behind him! He'll nosedive before he clears the clubhouse! He'll crash into those trees along the edge of the golf course! The group on the field at Westbury Long Island held their breaths as they watched James Dent take off in the wildest, most erratic flight that they had ever seen. Under lowering storm clouds, with the wind roaring half a hurricane behind him, Dent spiraled upwards as if unconscious of the laws of earthly gravity. I told you so. You ought to have stopped him, even if it is his private plane. A feller's got no business trying to break his neck. Look there. He's cleared those trees after all. James Dent had cleared them, and the clubhouse too, and was already disappearing across the Hempstead Plains, looking like a leaf whirling up in a winter storm. At a height of five hundred feet, he sped eastward. Didn't tell you where he was going? Nope. Acted like a crazy man. Something on his mind, sure. Wherever he's bound for, he'll never get there. But James Dent was already out of sight, and the little group dispersed. And Dent, winging his way due east, over the oak barrens of central Long Island, was conscious neither of the storm that howled about him, nor of the excitement that his rash take-off had occasioned. The rain lashed him in the open cockpit, the ground fog swirled about him, and, though it was still afternoon, there brooded a somber twilight over the wastes. But in his mind Dent was already anticipating his descent at the Vanishing Place, as the natives called it, near Peconic Bay. The Vanishing Place was so called because of the terrible and inexplicable catastrophe that had occurred there five years previously. In the two-century-old farmhouse, Miles Parrish, the world's greatest authority on physical chemistry, had been conducting investigations into the structure of the atom. James Dent and Lucius Toda had been associated with Old Parish in this work, which, carried to a successful issue, would revolutionize the social organization of the world. The energy locked up in the atom is so stupendous that, as Eddington indicated, a thimble full of coal, disintegrated, would carry the Mauritania from England to America and back again. To unlock this energy would be to set man free from bondage, to restore the pristine leisure and happiness of Eden. And because the three men were playing with deadly forces of incalculable power, this deserted spot had been selected for the carrying on of the investigations. The old farmhouse had been converted into a laboratory. For days together the three had bent over their tubes and laboratory apparatus, hardly eating or sleeping and the day had come when success had seemed almost within their grasp. Dent had received six months' leave of absence from his duties at Columbia University in order to prosecute the experiments. As the weeks went by, and the blind track that the three were following opened into a clear road, a sort of madness settled upon every one of them. The Planck bohr quantum theory that the energy of a body cannot vary continuously, but only by a certain finite amount, or exact multiples of this amount, had been the key that unlocked the door. But always it had been Lucius Toda who led the way. Toda was a graduate of the University of Virginia, and accounted one of the most brilliant minds of his generation. At thirty, he stood head and shoulders above his contemporaries. Dark, handsome, fearless, with a willpower that nothing seemed able to subdue, he had taken the leadership away from old Miles Parrish, who eagerly and without thought of his own reputation followed in his assistant's footsteps. There were the three men, and there was the girl, Lucille Parrish, the child of Miles's old age. Seventeen, when the catastrophe occurred, she had come out to the deserted spot sometimes of a Sunday from her boarding school at Garden City. And Toda had found time to make love to her when he rushed her back to her school in his high-powered foreign car. Jim Dent had known nothing of that until after the catastrophe. Lucille had been afraid of him, afraid to open her mouth upon the subject even to her father. And she had been fascinated, too, as a young girl may well be, 
when a fascinating man of thirty uses his arts to win her. It was only by chance that Jim had failed to be involved in the hideous catastrophe that had stamped the old farmhouse with the name of Vanishing Place whenever the natives spoke of it. Two killed in laboratory explosion was the heading in the next morning's paper which gave Jim his first intimation of the accident. He had been to Columbia overnight to look up a new publication that contained an article on the hydrogen spectrum. It was only a long paragraph, and the names of Parrish and Toda meant nothing to the man who had written it. But Jim had taken train to Hempstead, taxied to the flying fields, and essayed his first plane ride to Peconic Bay in the charge of a pilot. A group of natives, three newspaper men and a Suffolk County policeman, were near the spot where the farmhouse had been. Near the spot, not on it. For where the farmhouse had been was a great pool of stagnant water, black as ink, covering an expanse of perhaps three-quarters of an acre. "'No, sir, there was no explosion,' said the officer. "'At least none of these fellows heard anything. Just a—' "'You tell the professor, Mr. Lum.' "'It was about half-past eight last night, Mr. Dent,' said Andrew Lum, who kept the village store a mile away. "'Ground seemed to rock. Earthquake,' I says to myself, holding on to the door. "'But it wasn't no earthquake. Too gentle for that. Nothing broke, not even a plate. Then I says to Mrs. Lum—' They're gone, poor fellers, and I always know it'd be that way. It's lucky young Mr. Dent went out last night on the 715. We hurried here, but there wasn't no sign of the place, just a hole in the ground with a sort of sticky mud in it. Water's been filling in since then, but I guess it's reached its level now. They just blowed themselves to bits, Mr. Dent. Tell them about the violet light, Andy, put in one of the bystanders. Yeah, like a pillar of violet fire that were, Mr. Dent. We seed it through the trees, but by the time we got here it was almost gone. Gosh, that throwed a scare into some of us. It was Mr. Toad's soul a-burning, squeaked Grandpa Dawes. I always said that feller'd come to no good end. The group shook their heads and remained silent. It was clear that, if they did not share Grandpa Dawes's opinion, at least they considered it not without the bounds of plausibility. Lucius Toda had created a bad impression among the natives. Jim Dent stooped and picked up something lying embedded in the mud at the edge of the black pool, and slipped it into his pocket. He had been present at the inquest, and had gone back to Columbia. That had been five years before. Professor McDowd, the paleontologist, had identified the object Jim had found as the milk molar of Merichippus insignis, the Miocene representative of the modern horse, and that had made Jim Dent think furiously. The catastrophe must have been a gigantic one to have flung up that fossil tooth from strata far beneath the level of the Earth's surface. More, there were even traces of Archean deposits around the borders of the pool, whose depth, in the center, was ascertained to be 164 feet. Black, silent, uninhabited, unstirred save by a passing breeze, the pool had remained those five years past. The spot was shunned as haunted or accursed by the superstitious country folks. Dense underbrush had grown up around it. Periodically, Jim had gone out to visit it. That was how he had come to invest in a private plane. It was only an hour to the flying fields, and less than an hour from there to Peconic Bay. What he expected to achieve he did not know. In the back of his mind was the belief that some day he would light upon some clue that would tell something of the unusual catastrophe. And then, that afternoon, he had been shaken to the depths when a message came to him in Lucille's voice over the telephone. I've heard from Dad! Winging his way eastward through the storm, Jim Dent was mentally reconstructing all that had led up to the present moment. Lucille had finished her high school course and gone into business life. Jim had found a position for her as secretary to a small group of physicists, who were conducting private investigations a position for which her training well fitted her. She had done well. He had kept in touch with her. Six months before, their relations had altered. They had realized that they were in love with each other. In the months that followed, they had discovered all sorts of things about each other that neither had suspected, which might be summed up by saying that they had become all in all to each other. It was so amazing, this transformation of ordinary friendship into radiant love, that they were still bewildered over it. They were to be married at the end of the year. It was then that Lucille had first told Jim about Lucius's wooing and her fear of the man. Apart from that, 
both had refrained by tacit agreement from making reference to the past. And then, that afternoon, there sounded Lucille's voice over the telephone. I've heard from Dad. From your father? You're mistaken, dear. No, Jim, I'm not mistaken. He called me on the phone two hours ago. I couldn't mistake his voice, and besides, he called me Lucy, like he used to do. He told me to come at once to the vanishing place, but not to tell a soul unless I wished to do him a great evil. Then he rang off. Where are you now? asked Jim. I'm phoning from Amityville. I took the train immediately, but I was so frightened, and... And at last I decide I must tell you. I didn't think Dad would have minded my telling you, so I got out. There's another train in a few minutes, and I shall go on to Hampton Bays and walk the two miles to the vanishing place. I... I'll meet you there. Lucille, wait. Can't you meet me somewhere else, and we'll go on together? I'll get my plane and... Oh, I just can't wait, Jim. I'm in such terror that I won't find Dad when I get there. And he told me to tell nobody. I... I'll meet you at the vanishing place, Jim. And so great had been her agitation that with that arrangement Jim had had to rest content. He had taken a taxi out to the flying fields at once. In half an hour he would know what had happened, and he was obsessed by the terror that he would not find Lucille or anything except the lonely pool. That was why he opened the throttle and drove on wildly through the scurrying wraiths of mist, pierced by the tops of trees that at times rose dangerously near the spreading wings. That gap in the trees was Lake Ranconcoma. Not far now. Jim would know soon. But as he flew, vague fears that had beset his mind since he had received Lucille's message began to crystallize into the single fear of Tota. If Parrish was really alive, why not Tota too? Beneath the polish and the surface comradeship, Jim had always been conscious of some diablerie about the man, of some inner life of which he knew nothing, something unscrupulous and relentless, something infinitely cruel as when he had tested the Atom Smasher on a stray cur that had run into the laboratory, not for experimentation, but in mere ruthless savagery, converting the living beast instantly into a shapeless mass of flesh and bone. And Tota had known more about the Atom Smasher, as they affectionately called the mechanism for releasing atomic energy, than old Parrish and he together. Suppose Lucille's story were true. Suppose old Parrish were actually alive. Suppose Tota were responsible for some designed scheme which would, in the end, place Lucille in his power. Wild thoughts and fears, but Jim would soon know, and with throttle stretched to the limit he went roaring over the scrub oak toward Peconic Bay. It was beginning to grow dark, almost too dark for landing, but now Jim could feel the tang of the salt wind upon his face. He slowed down. The fog was as thick as ever, but the scrub oak had given place to more open country. In a minute or two, he ought to sight some landmark. Yes, he had overshot his mark, for suddenly, through a gap in the mists, he saw the line of breakers forming a white ridge upon the sand. A mile southward! Jim knew where he was now, for he knew every curve of that shore. He banked and turned. And then he saw something that for an instant chilled his blood. Not far away, and not far beneath him, a ghostly violet haze was spreading through the fog, and the fog itself was coiling back from it until it formed a dense white wall. For a moment, Jim's hand was paralyzed upon the stick. The next, his decision was made. He closed his throttle and went down in a slow descent right toward the heart of that column of lavender smoke that seemed to be springing straight up out of the ground. A pillar of violet fire. It could not have been described better. The plane dived through the dense wall of fog, which, for a moment, shut out the violet fire completely. Then Jim was through, and almost immediately beneath him lay the black and glassy surface of the pool. Out of the very heart of it rose the fire, burning like some infernal flame that consumed nothing, and between it and the fog was a space of almost translucent air, extending to the borders of the pool. Jim began to circle the pool to find a landing place. But as he looked down, the surface of the pool began to change its aspect. In place of the unruffled calm, it began to work with some devil's yeast all around the central pillar of flame, until its depths seemed to be churned up in frothy masses, and the movement extended almost to the circumference. Then the whole surface of the water began to tilt and sway, 
with a slow, shimmering, undulatory movement, as if it was a giant roulette wheel in rotation. And something was materializing out of the heart of the violet flame itself. It was a face, a human face, with bestial features, distorted and enormously magnified through the substance in which it was. Such a face as might look back upon an observer out of one of those distorting mirrors at Coney Island, or some other place of popular amusement, but twisted and enlarged beyond conception so that it covered half the area of a city block. Curiously blurred, too, as if each atom of that face was an isolated motion on its own account. And beneath the face appeared the vague outlines of a hand, apparently manipulating some sort of infernal mechanism. And that face, enlarged as it was out of all proportion, filled Jim's heart with greater horror than any face he had ever known. For it was the visage of Lucius Toda, and on those huge and distorted features was something that looked like a diabolical smile. Everything vanished. Jim was back in the surrounding wall of fog. Instinctively, he banked again. He strove to drive the horror from his brain. He must circle, circle incessantly in the hope of finding Lucille. She must have already arrived. But if she had not fallen into Toda's power, she would hear the roaring of the plane and manage to signal him. He circled back into the clear space between the white and the violet, and now he saw that the effect upon the pool was still more pronounced. The waters were rising up in a rim all around, and yet not overflowing. They were standing up like a bowl of clay upon the potter's wheel, and down in the depths Jim could see the head and shoulders of Toda, much less magnified, more natural in appearance, and less blurred. And Toda was looking up at him and pointing that infernal mechanism at him, something that looked like the tube of a telescope. Suddenly the plane shivered and stood still. The motor died abruptly. The stick went dead, and yet the plane did not fall. As if upheld by the same repulsive force that drove back the white fog, it simply hung suspended three hundred feet above the heart of the violet flame. Then there was no longer any plane. The stick had melted in Jim's hand. The wings dissolved like wreaths of mist. The entire body had disintegrated into nothingness. Jim sat suspended in the void, and felt himself very slowly descending into the violet column. Down into the vortex of that bubbling pool, which rimmed him on all sides. Down into the central aperture, out of which emerged the leering face of Toda. And as he dropped, Jim heard, thin, faint, and very far away, the despairing cry of Lucille. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Old Friends and Foes Jim must have lapsed into unconsciousness, for when he opened his eyes there was a gap in his consciousness of the passage of time, though none in his memory. He opened his eyes, and instantly he remembered everything. Only a brief interval could have elapsed, for it was not quite dark. The fog and the violet flame had cleared away. Overhead, a few stars twinkled. Jim was lying on his side, half buried in the black, slimy mud of the dried-up pool. There was nothing but the smooth, shelving mud basin, with the scrub oak surrounding it. Toda and the machine had vanished. Jim pulled himself with an effort out of the sucking mud and, heavily clogged with it, began to make his way toward the margin. Stumbling, struggling through the viscid ooze, he shouted Lucille's name despairingly. But no answer came, and his cries only made the utter silence all about him seem more fearsome. Exhausted by his efforts, he gained the edge of the pool at last and stopped, trying to orientate himself. As he did so, he saw a human face peering at him out of a clump of scrub oak. It was the face of an aged man with a long white beard and rags of clothes that were festooned about him. Jim took a step toward it, shouting a challenge. Next moment, it had hurled itself out of its shelter toward him, and two skeleton-like arms were twined about his shoulders while the fingers worked upward toward his throat. The face was that of a madman crazed by fear, and Jim recognized it. It was the face of Professor Parrish. 
Parrish, the trim, immaculate, clean-shaven, urbane old man, whose lectures, imbued with wit and scholarship, had always been the delight of his classes. Parrish, reduced to this gibbering maniac. And yet Parrish himself returned to the site of their experiments after five years. So fierce was the old man's onset, so desperate his clutch, that for a half minute or more Jim was reduced to fighting for his life. The clawing fingers, armed with long nails, furrowed Jim's throat. There was a terrific strength in the body, wasted though it was almost to a skeleton. But it was only for a half minute that old Parrish's endurance lasted. Suddenly the old man went limp and tottered forward, dropped upon the ground. Jim bent over him. Parrish, you know me. I'm Jim Dent, he cried. I came here to save you. Parrish was muttering something. Jim caught the words, Toda, and, God help Lucille. Parrish, I'm Jim Dent, Jim cried again. And the old man, shuddering, opened his eyes and recognized him. Jim, he muttered. Jim Dent, then where is she? I got away from that devil, found farmhouse empty, got telephone book, found her and phoned her, told her to come, save Lucille. He fell back, his eyes closed. Jim crouched over the unconscious old man. He was in a state of utter perplexity. He could not quite gather what Parrish had been trying to tell him, and it was with difficulty that he could focus his mind upon the situation, so great had been the shock of finding his former chief in that condition. What had become of his plane? And where was Lucille? Jim was positive that he had heard her cry for help out of the vortex in the water. But there was no water. Only the circle of black mud extended in the starlight. Again and again Jim shouted Lucille's name, and his cries went echoing away through the scrub without result. Jim looked down at the unconscious old man beside him. He must get Parrish away, get him to Andy Lums. He bent over him again and raised him in his arms. Suddenly he heard two familiar sounds behind him, two dull thumps that sounded less like explosions than echoes, long drawn out and receding into infinity. There was no other sound quite like them that he had ever heard. They were the snap of the electrical discharge as the atom smasher began to operate, and why the snap had sounded like a heavy body falling a long distance away was not known. Toda had said one day, with what Jim had taken for sarcasm, that they represented the wave series of a single sound extended in time to make four-dimensional action but Jim had never considered the explanation seriously. That sound, bringing back all Jim's memories of their experiments, brought him to his feet sharply. He swung around. The surface of the pool was a bubbling, seething mass of mud and water, and over its surface that faint violet haze was beginning to spread. In the center, where the light was thickest, something like a gyroscope appeared to be revolving. Out of the gyroscope something was beginning to project, that infernal tube of Lucius Toda. And Jim knew that in the heart of the flame that enormous distorted face of Lucius Toda would again be visible. The human nervous system can only endure a certain amount of impact. The sight of that ghastly flame already condensing into a violet pillar was more than Jim could stand. He dragged old Parrish to his feet and started off with him into the thickest part of the undergrowth. A fearful scream behind him stopped him at the very edge of the scrub. He looked back, still supporting the half-conscious old man in his arms. The violet flame was shooting up in a straight pillar, the whole central portion of the pool was dry, and the waters were heaped up all around it. From the slightly elevated spot where Jim stood, he could see Toda holding Lucille in his arms in the very heart of the fire, which threw a pale, fluorescent light over their faces. Toda was wearing a spotted skin like that of a leopard, and Lucille was in the blue frock that she had worn when Jim and she had dinner together two evenings before. Jim dropped old Parrish, shouted in answer, and dashed back like a madman down the slope into the solid wall of water. He fought his way desperately through that wall, which seemed of the consistency of soft rubber or treacle, as if some subtle change had taken place in its molecular isomers. It adhered to him without wetting him, and he plunged through it, hearing Lucille cry out again, and yet again. And now he was through, 
and once more struggling over the viscid surface of the pond. Behind him he heard old Parrish blundering and screeching at the top of his voice, but he paid no attention to him. He could see Lucille more clearly, and the large, hazy outlines of Tota's features were beginning to assume the proper proportions. There was a diabolical leer upon Tota's face, unchanged during the five years since Jim had seen him last, except that it had become more evil, more powerful. The enormous and distorted face that Jim had seen had been simply due to the presence of some refracting medium. The pillar of violet light was thinning, spreading out over the pool, but Jim could now see the scene more clearly than before even as he rushed onward. The machine was inside what looked like a flat boat, but more circular than a boat, and apparently was made of some metal resembling aluminum. Either from the metal hull, or from the mechanism inside it, there was emitted a pungent odor resembling chlorine. The mechanism itself bore some resemblance to the old atom smasher of five years before, but it appeared to be immensely more complicated. Wheels of various sizes were set at every conceivable angle around the central tube from which the violet light was emanating, and all were rotating and gyrating so fast that they looked like disks of light. The boat itself was trembling, and this movement appeared to be communicated to the boiling mud in the central part of the pool. As Jim tried to leap down through the sucking mud to snatch Lucille from Tota, the latter stopped, straightened himself, and pointed a short tube at Jim's heart. Jim felt as if an enormous invisible force had struck him in the chest. It was apparently the same repulsive force that had driven back the waters. The shock was not a violent one. It did not throw him off his feet. It merely pushed him slowly and irresistibly backward. And the whole picture was beginning to fade. Etched sharply in the violet light one moment, it now looked like a drawing that had been covered with tissue paper. The outlines were dissolving into a haze, or, rather, each line seemed reproduced an infinite number of times, as the edge of a vibrating saw shows an infinitude of edges. The violet fire was becoming still more diffused. It hovered over the waters, a pale, flickering glow. And simultaneously, the walls of water began to break and come surging forward. Jim saw Lucille stretching out her arms toward him and tried to struggle forward, but in vain. She cried out his name, and he put all his strength into that desperate, futile struggle to reach her. But he was being borne backward by the invisible power in the tube. The rushing torrent was surging about his knees, grew waist-deep, in another moment, Jim was swimming for his life against the furious flood. Suddenly, however, the tremendous pressure on his chest was relaxed. Tota had turned the tube away from him. He was leaning forward, out of the boat, and grasped old Parrish, who had been flung violently against it by the dissolving waters. The same flood carried Jim to the boat's side. Here, however, the flood was only knee-deep, owing to the repulsion still being exercised by the violet light which was glimmering feebly. Jim found his feet and leaped into the craft. He grasped Lucille in his arms. He turned to confront Tota, who had just dragged old Parrish over the side. The three men confronted one another. "'Turn that tube on me and I'll jump into your damn machinery and bust it!' Jim shouted. An ironical expression came on Tota's face. It was clear that he still considered himself master of the situation." At the immediate moment, Dent, the lives of all of us depend on your keeping absolutely still, he answered. Take my advice and sit down. Jim saw Lucille's face, ghastly in the faint violet light that played about it. The girl had fainted. She was lying unconscious, her feet against the circular metal plate that protected the machinery, her head upon the rail that ran around the boat's upper edge. Tota, without waiting for Jim's answer, stepped over the plate and took his seat at a sort of instrument board with control levers and thumb screws that apparently controlled the needles on four dials. He touched a button, and instantly the violet light disappeared. With its vanishing, the waves came surging forward and lapped violently against the hull, as if about to overwhelm the vessel, which, however, seemed immovable. It simply rose higher in the water. Jim understood the cause of this. Those gyroscopes would retain the hull in the same position against anything but a mechanical force strong enough to ruin it. He watched Tota as he sat at the instrument board, which was illuminated by two tiny lights of what looked like mercury vapor. 
His face, handsome and cruel as ever, was tense as he manipulated the thumbscrews. Beside him lay Parrish, faintly whimpering. The old man had evidently abandoned all hope of effecting his escape, or of rescuing his daughter. It was unbearable to have to sit there, knowing that the three of them were absolutely at Tota's mercy, and yet there was nothing else to do. Tota looked up with a saturnine smile. It's a delicate operation to blur the present without shooting out a hundred years or so in time, he said. But my micrometer's pretty accurate, Dent. Don't move, I caution you. He smiled again. Yes, Dent. Time is something like the fourth dimension of space, as we believed in the old days, and I've proved it. Jim saw Tota touch the screw that controlled the fourth dial, and instantly it was borne in on him that each of the dials controlled one spatial dimension. This fourth, then, was the time dimension. Could it be true that Tota had solved the practical problem of traveling in time, theoretically implied since the discoveries of Einstein? He had known in the old days that the Atom Smasher might be adapted to this purpose, but neither Parrish nor he had dreamed of turning aside from their endeavor to utilize it for the purpose of releasing atomic energy. Thump! Thump! The familiar old sound, rushing back into memory after all those years, the release of the electrical discharge echoing through infinity. The scrub around the pool blurred and was gone. A vast gray panorama extended itself on either side of them. They were traveling, in space, and time, too. Jim no longer doubted, and, chilled with horror, he sat there, his arm about Lucille's unconscious form. End of Chapter 2 Recorded by Allison Stewart, Concord, California